Okay, um, welcome to panel four on uh, dispute um, settlement. Uh, we are going to address a dispute settlement. Uh, first, uh, Professor Ursula Kriebaum uh, will address dispute settlement under the withdrawal agreement. And then second, Professor Holger Hestermeyer online will examine dispute settlement under the trade and cooperation agreement. This is a slight tweak compared to the original uh, program, thanks to the proactive um, coordination of my uh, two uh, panelists in advance of our uh, conference. Now, let me briefly introduce uh, the two speakers in the order in which they will uh, speak. First, to my right uh, is Professor uh, Ursula uh, Kriebaum. She's a professor of public international law at the University of Vienna. She previously worked, among others, as a legal advisor at the Austrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and as a legal expert on Holocaust restitution issues. She's a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, um, among other uh, functions, and particularly pertinent for our, pan uh, for our panel, a member of the panel of arbitrators under the agreement on the withdrawal of the UK uh, from uh, the European Union. Among her many publications are most recently uh, Principles of International Investment Law, published by OUP, and uh, a German monograph on the protection of property in both international investment law and uh, human rights. Online, we will be seeing uh, Professor Holger Hestermeyer uh, in uh, a little while. Uh, he is co-director of the Center for International Governance and Dispute Resolution and Professor of International and EU Law at the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College London. He has received a Otto Hahn Medal um, and a British Academy Mid-Career Fellowship for his uh, research and has acted as Specialist Advisor uh, to the EU External Affairs Subcommittee and the EU Select Committee of the House of Lords and has worked previously as a referendaire at the Court of Justice of the European Union. Among his many publications, um, there is a recent monograph in German on authority and homogeneity in federal systems focusing on uh, Germany, the United States and uh, Europe and an earlier monograph uh, on human rights and WTO law focusing on patents and access to um, essential medicines. So without further ado, we'll start uh, with uh, the withdrawal agreement, dispute settlement under the withdrawal agreement. I hand over to my colleague, Professor Kriebaum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, the dispute settlement provisions in the Brexit agreement are not midnight clauses. What is a midnight clause? I don't know who coined the phrase, but the scenario is that after lengthy, exhausting negotiations during the entire day, where the parties discuss every little detail of a contract at a time when everybody wants to go home, someone raises the issue, perhaps we also need a dispute resolution clause. No, dispute resolution, and especially the role of the Court of Justice of the EU, was at the heart of the Brexit campaign. Brexit supporters have argued that, quote, EU judges has overruled UK laws on issues like counter-terrorism powers, migration, VAT, and whether prisoners should be allowed to vote, end of quote, which was said to lead to a loss of control, deeply damaging and undemocratic. The example shows that even courts that have nothing to do with the EU, like the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice of the European Union were mixed up by the campaigners. Theresa May in her function as prime minister said that one of the main objectives of the withdrawal negotiations was to, quote, take back control of our laws and to bring an end to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in Britain. The EU, on the other hand, wanted a dispute settlement mechanism that assures the autonomy of the Union and its legal order, and wanted to ensure the effective implementation of the withdrawal agreement, if possible, by the Court of Justice of the European Union. Okay, as you can imagine, um, not surprisingly, the result was a compromise. And we see that a certain fading out of the jurisdiction of the court 
of justice in the different phases after the Brexit. We can distinguish at least two phases. The period between the 31st of January 2020, when the UK left the Union, and the 31st of December 2020, the so-called transition period, and the time after the 1st of January 2021, when the dispute settlement provisions of the withdrawal agreement became controlling and the EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement entered into force provisionally. During the transition period, so 31st of January 2020 to 31st of December 2020, EU law, with a few exceptions, continued to apply and union institutions retain the powers they have under EU law. In the context of dispute settlement, this was especially relevant for the Commission and the Court of Justice. The withdrawal agreement provides that during the transition period, the European Commission could bring infringement proceedings and refer potential breaches of EU law to the Court of Justice as if the UK still were a member of the EU and it did so. It can still do so for four years after the end of the transition period with regard to breaches that have occurred before the end of the transition period. The same is true for alleged breaches of the withdrawal agreement during the transition period. Concerning the role of the case law of the Court of Justice in the interpretation of provisions of the withdrawal agreement that refer to provisions or concepts of EU law, the end of the transition period is also important. The UK and its judicial and administrative organs have to interpret these provisions in, quote, conformity with the relevant case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union, handed down before the end of the transition period, end of quote. They are only under an obligation to, quote, have regard to the relevant case law, end of quote, of the Court of Justice that is handed down after the end of the transition period. Okay, so once it's in conformity, the other type uh, is having due regard. So you can see a certain phasing out. According to Article 86 of the Withdrawal Agreement, the Court of Justice has jurisdiction for any proceedings brought by or against the UK before the end of the transition period and retains this jurisdiction after the transition period. Furthermore, the Court of Justice has powers concerning certain articles of the Northern Ireland Protocol. These cover exchanges of information, provisions on customs and movements of goods relating to Northern Ireland, technical regulations, value-added tax and excise law, electricity markets and state aid law as applicable to Northern Ireland. And the provisions of the protocol shall be interpreted in accordance with the case law of the Court of Justice, including the case law after the transition period. Similar rules uh, exist with regard to the UK sovereign basis in Cyprus. At the end of the transition period, IA as of 1st January 2021, the dispute settlement process established by the withdrawal agreement became operational. So let me give you now an overview of this process. Part six of the withdrawal agreement contains provisions for dispute settlement to deal with disagreements on the interpretation, implementation, and application of the agreement. Articles 167 to 181 of the withdrawal agreement, as well as Annex 9, Part A, entitled Rules of Procedure for Dispute Settlement, and Part B, that contains a code of conduct for members of arbitration panels deal with dispute settlement. The withdrawal agreement provides for several bodies that have different roles in the dispute settlement process. These are a joint committee, six specialized committees for political decision-making, an arbitral panel, and the Court of Justice. 
Title one of part six is concerned with the consistent interpretation and application of the withdrawal agreement, including the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice in certain specified areas. Title two contains institutional provisions and provides among others for the establishment of a joint committee to oversee the application and implementation of the withdrawal agreement. And title three regulates the dispute settlement process and provides uh, that the remedies provided for in the withdrawal agreement are exclusive remedies. So the joint committee consists of representatives from the European Union and the United Kingdom. And as I already mentioned, the task is to supervise the implementation and application of the withdrawal agreement with the exception of part two, citizens' rights. That what, that's what you just have heard in the previous presentation. This joint committee is co-chaired by the EU and the UK at the ministerial and commission level. Decisions are taken by consent, therefore both parties have always to agree. Article 169 of the withdrawal agreement provides that any dispute settlement procedure must start with consultations in the joint committee. To start this three month consultation period as provided for by Article 169 of the agreement, the interested party has to write a notice to the joint committee, presumably indicating that this is a notice under Article 169, starting the dispute settlement procedure, because most likely they will also before that already negotiate, but to be sure that you formally start this process, you need this written notion and just to make it sure uh, that it is the written notion, it's wise to say so. If the parties can find a common solution, the dispute settlement process ends. The withdrawal agreement does not indicate any formal requirements for such a solution. In case the joint committee is unable to resolve a dispute on the interpretation or application of the treaty within this three month period, each party has a right to initiate a request for arbitration in writing. The party initiating arbitration has to send this request to the other party and to the International Bureau of the Permanent Court of arbitration yeah, the PCA was apparently an institution that both sides uh, trusted and therefore it has quite some uh, role in this uh, arbitration uh, proceedings. The request has to identify the subject matter of the dispute and must contain a summary of the legal arguments supporting the request. This starts the arbitration procedure. The scope of the dispute referred to arbitration in this manner must stay within the scope of the written notice for consultations submitted to the joint committee. Furthermore, this request for arbitration eliminates the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal uh, set up to give a ruling under the withdrawal agreement. A classical arbitration panel shall then decide the dispute. According to the withdrawal agreement, the joint committee before the end of the transition period had to establish a list of 25 persons who are willing and able to serve as members of an arbitration panel. For this purpose, the EU and the UK each provided a list of 10 persons and jointly established a list comprising five persons who can serve as chairpersons for the arbitration panel. The joint committee established a list on the 17th of December 2020. Interestingly, Article 171 of the agreement does not contain any rules of nationality, with the result that the current chairpersons list also includes EU and UK nationals, which makes that you can have two UK nationals and one EU national or the other way around on that. The International Bureau of the PCA will provide secretarial services and other logistical support to the arbitration panel. 
The required qualifications for arbitrators are independence beyond doubt, possession of the qualifications required for appointment to the highest judicial office in their respective countries or to consult of recognized competence and specialized knowledge or experience of union law and public international law. Persons on the list must not be members, officials, or other servants of the EU institutions or of the government of the UK. Unlike standard arbitral tribunals that typically have three members, an arbitration panel under the withdrawal agreement consists of five persons. Each of the disputing party nominates two from the list of 10 persons they each that they each have established uh, for that purpose. The four members of the panel shall then select by consensus the chairperson from the list of chairpersons jointly established by the EU and the UK. In case the four members cannot agree on a chairperson, each party to the dispute can ask the Secretary General of the PCA to select the chairperson per lot from this list of chairpersons. Article 171 provides that the panel shall be established within 15 days of the date of a request for arbitration. This is fairly short. Yeah? If you take the exit convention there, the two parties have 90 days uh, to accomplish this task. Article 172 of the withdrawal agreement refers to the dispute settlement, refers for the dispute settlement uh, procedure to Annex 9, Part A, that contains the rules of procedure. It contains definitions, rules on notifications, rules concerning the appointment and replacement of members of an arbitral tribunal, financial issues, rules concerning timetables and written submissions, hearings, confidentiality and an expedited procedure, as well as provi provisions concerning the language of proceedings. Part P of Annex 9 contains a code of conduct for members of arbitration panels. The code of conduct provides requirements for panel members to show their independence, i.e. disclose any associations or interests that may impact on their impartiality and contains rules on how panel members have to fulfill their arbitral duties with both diligence and independence. The proceedings are characterized by strict deadlines. The outcome of the proceedings is called ruling, and the panel has in principle to issue its ruling within a period of 12 months from the establishment of the panel. Yeah, this is fairly short. Yeah? In ICSID, we are now at an average of eight years in more complex uh, economic cases. This period will be interrupted if a question of EU law is referred to the Code of Justice of the EU for a preliminary ruling. We will discuss this constellation in a minute. If the panel is unable to respect this 12 months limit, the chair will have to notify the parties in writing on the reasons and indicate when the panel in the, intends to complete its work. The panel has to establish an indicative timetable within seven days after its establishment. 20 days later, the complainant has to supply its written submission to the panel and the respondent has to submit its submission 20 days thereafter. That's also fairly short uh, periods for um, such uh, an endeavor. The UK or the EU can also submit that a case shall be considered urgent if the panel agrees on the urgency of the case, it will make every effort to rule within six months. The chairperson presides over the hearing or hearings, which are in principle open to the public and take place in the premises of the PCA in The Hague. Only members of the arbitration panel may take part in the deliberations. Their assistance may also assist to the deliberations, but may not take part. And it is the exclusive responsibility of the panel members to draft a ruling, and this duty may not be delegated. Article 180 provides that whenever possible, the panel shall take decisions by consensus. If this is not possible, the panel will decide by majority vote. However, 
uh, it's not possible to make published dissenting opinions. So you may dissent, but that will uh, never become public. Uh, in most arbitration uh, systems that, that are kind of uh, used in, in public international law scenarios, um, you would find a possibility of dissenting opinions. In national arbitration systems, the picture is mixed. So I've recently been told that in Germany, there's also no possibility to issue uh, dissenting opinions. And those who have negotiated the withdrawal agreement might know uh, why uh, it is like that in the withdrawal agreement. What we can see is that the system is similar to what we have in the uh, European Court of Justice. There, we also don't have uh, dissenting uh, opinions. Article 181 emphasizes that the independence of the members of the arbitration panel and state that they shall not take any instructions from any organization or government. And part B of Annex 9 contains a code of conduct that also plays a lot of emphasis on the independence uh, of the members. The rulings of the arbitration panel are binding for the EU and the UK, and the panel has to give reasons for its findings and the conclusions, which have to be set out in rulings. The rulings will be made publicly available subject to the protection of confidential information. There is no appeal provided for against uh, rulings of the panel. However, also the Court of Justice has its role. For the European Union, it was of critical importance that the arbitration panel may not decide on a question of the interpretation of EU law referred to in the withdrawal agreement or on the concept of EU law, but it has to refer such questions to the Court of Justice of the European Union. This is done through a request for a binding preliminary ruling. The same is true if the panel has to decide on the compliance of the United Kingdom with the withdrawal agreement concerning the implementation of a court of justice judgment in infringement procedures concerning a case brought before the court of justice before or during the transition period. If the panel does not refer a question of EU law ex officio to the court of justice, both the UK or the EU may also submit a request to the arbitration panel to refer the matter to the Court of Justice if they consider that it contains a question of interpretation of EU law. In such a situation, the arbitral panel will need to give reasons why it does not consider the issue to be a matter of EU law or how it can decide the dispute without giving an interpretation on a concept or provision of EU law. The referral to the Court of Justice suspends the time limits for rendering the arbitration panel's ruling. The panel has obviously to wait for the Court of Justice ruling and is required to give its ruling at the earliest 60 days following the receipt of the Court of Justice ruling. As I already said, Article 175 provides that the arbitration panel rulings are binding on the EU and the UK. Both parties, quote, shall take any measure necessary to comply in good faith with the arbitration panel ruling, end of quote. If the complainant prevailed, the parties need to agree on a time frame for the implementation of the ruling. For this purpose, the respondent should inform the complainant on the time it will need for compliance with the ruling. In case of a disagreement between the parties on the period required for compliance, the complainant can request the arbitration panel to determine a reasonable period of time for compliance. The second step is to take the measures necessary for compliance with the ruling within the period agreed by the parties or decided by the panel as being reasonable. 
The dispute ends at this point, except where the complainant considers that the respondent has failed to comply with the arbitration panel's ruling. In this case, it can ask the panel to rule on this matter. In case questions about the interpretation of EU concepts of law arise, the panel again is obliged to ask for a preliminary reference from the Court of Justice of the European Union. In case a panel finds that the respondent did not comply with the panel ruling within a reasonable period of time, Article 178 provides for temporary remedies for the complainant. The complainant can ask the panel to impose a lump sum or a penalty payment on a non-complying respondent. The panel enjoys discretion for this purpose and will consider the seriousness and the duration of any non-compliance and the underlying breach when fixing such a sum or payment. If the respondent does not pay the amount of the lump sum or penalty within one month after the arbitration panel has determined it, or if the respondent persists in non-complying with the panel's ruling on the dispute six months after the initial ruling, then the withdrawal agreement provides that the complainant will be entitled to suspend any part of the withdrawal agreement except part two, the citizens' rights provisions. It can also suspend parts of any other agreement between the UK and the EU under the conditions set out in that agreement. The complainant has to notify its intended action to suspend parts of the withdrawal agreement or other agreements to the respondent. Any suspension of agreed provisions must be proportionate to the breach of the obligation concerned, and the respondent can request a ruling from the arbitration panel if it considers the suspension of the claimant's obligations to be disproportionate. The suspension of the obligations is intended to be temporary and must be applied only until any measure found to be inconsistent with the withdrawal agreement has been withdrawn or amended or until the UK and the EU have agreed otherwise to settle the dispute. Article 179 provides for a review of any action taken to suspend treaty obligations following non-compliance with an arbitration panel ruling. The respondent will notify the complainant of any measures taken to comply and can request an end to the suspension of obligations or to any ongoing penalty payment. If the two parties do not agree on whether the respondent has in the meantime complied with the original ruling, either party can request that the arbitration panel again rule on the matter. If the arbitration panel finds that the respondent has complied, the complainant is obliged to terminate the suspension of obligations. The penalty payments also shall be terminated. Here too, if issues of interpretation of EU law arise, the arbitration panel must refer them to the Court of Justice. The suspension of treaty obligations and the penalty payment should also be terminated if the complainant has not asked the arbitration panel to rule within 45 days of the respondent notifying of its compliance and requesting these to be terminated. What you can see is that this arbitration panel can hear one and the same case quite often uh, and that, uh, that there are several uh, possibilities uh, that it would be obliged uh, to ask uh, the European Court of Justice for a preliminary reference uh, and these preliminary references are Binding. And this system of preliminary references never phases out. So here the, the Court of Justice has a role uh, for ever. Thank you very much. With my former boss, I would say I hope you are more confused, but on a higher level. So, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Professor Kribam, for this uh, excellent overview of dispute settlement under the uh, withdrawal agreement. Please hold your questions until after Professor Hestermeyer's uh, presentation, to which we now uh, turn uh, straight away. 
uh, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you very much. Let me turn to my PowerPoint. And um, OK, this should work now. Can you see it? Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. OK, so um, I, talking about Brexit is a bit like walking down memory lane. And if you are an EU citizen living in the UK or a UK citizen living in the EU, it is at times a painful memory lane. Uh, which I was reminded of when we were speaking about health insurance and the pain it is to get health insurance ever actually done, uh, which shows the difficulties, even if there is a treaty. Um, in my last application, they had digitalized the whole procedure, but they had digitalized the wrong form, so I could not get health insurance. I had to appeal, and then on appeal got it. <clears throat> now, uh, if you are confused by the withdrawal agreement, the um, TCA is not going to make things very much better because, uh, as has already been uh, pointed out by Ambassador Schusterschitz, the, the problem with the TCA was the speed uh, at which some of the negotiation happened. I remember printing it out when it was first published. There were 20 empty pages in one of the annexes because uh, the states hadn't yet come to any decisions in that regard. Uh, part of the German translation was actually still in English because uh, they uh, were so tired that they had forgotten to translate that. And uh, the English text has never really been cleaned up. So when we speak about dispute settlement under the TCA, unfortunately, there's a whole lot of cross-references, details, little articles, exceptions. I will try to walk you through this mess and simplify things, and I apologize if I err on the side of oversimplifying at times. What will I speak about? First of all, how deep is your comprehensive free trade agreement? The TCA is a free trade agreement. That is what the UK insisted on. And as such, everything we will discuss in terms of dispute settlement will feel very famil familiar to a WTO lawyer or a trade lawyer, less so necessarily to an EU lawyer. <clears throat> We will then discuss the regular dispute settlement procedure. That is in part six. That's a state-to-state -state procedure between the EU and the UK. And we'll then speak about some of the modifications and special approaches, in particular, law enforcement and judicial cooperation. And finally, we have to address two actual innovations that are quite important and could actually become influential in the field of trade law overall. Uh, the two innovations serve two main interests fairness and speed. So we'll speak about the level playing field and rebalancing. That is the mechanism that is supposed to serve fairness in a world in which regulatory barriers to trade are the ones we most often face. And remedial measures, which are supposed to speed up procedures. And we'll discuss the need for speed in a moment. But first, how deep is your comprehensive free trade agreement? There was a problem um, for the UK and the EU in the negotiations, which was if you can manage to make chunks of EU law applicable, you simplify trade quite significantly. If you manage to, for example, uh, get the UK to apply EU law on sanitary and phytosanitary standards, uh, the need for a border on the island of Ireland is diminished significantly. But we get to the case law of the Court of Justice, which famously in Ahmea held that a dispute relating to the interpretation or application of EU law must be brought to a tribunal situated within the judicial system of the EU because only through a preliminary reference under Article 267 can the application, the proper application of EU law be ensured, or at least uh, <clears throat> there must be a review system in place um, for the award, and that review system is subject to Article 267. What does that mean for trade? Well, the EU, in its comprehensive and deep free trade agreement with the Ukraine, found a solution for how to make EU law applicable, namely in the arbitration procedure, so in the dispute settlement procedure under the free trade agreement, if a dispute raises a question of interpretation of a provision of EU law, <laughs> that mechanism can 
uh, put a reference to the court of justice. And hence, EU law can be made applicable. However, for the UK, any appeal to the Court of Justice was unpalatable. Accordingly, there is no equivalent provision in the TSA, and that also means EU law itself couldn't be made applicable. Now, the Court of Justice does make an appearance in Article 728. Uh, it's a bit uh, of um, eclectic provision on participation in union programs, and I'm going to uh, save you the details, uh, but it's a very, very limited uh, scope for the Court of Justice. In reality, uh, there is no role for the ECJ, and accordingly, um, EU law could not be imported into the agreement. That doesn't mean the agreement couldn't be inspired by EU law or copy provisions verbatim as part of an international agreement that then doesn't follow EU law, as you can see from the protocol on uh, social security because that is so largely inspired by the applicable EU law <laughs> that at times you can just follow the wording verbatim. <clears throat> Before we get to the dispute settlement mechanism as such, a quick word on governments. It has already been mentioned. The governance is reminiscent of other governance of other free trade agreements. You have a partnership council as the basic governance mechanism where the two parties meet um, and then in the implementation uh, of the EU, uh, it was made clear that member states can be there and so on and so forth. But that was a matter for the EU under international law, under the TCA. The Partnership Council has an EU representation, a UK representation, and that is the main body where problems are resolved. Then there are tons and tons of specialized committees. I won't bore you with them. But why are there so many committees? Well, because a lot of technical problems appear in trade. So just to give you a very absurd but quite pertinent example, um, the UK used to also be a repackaging center for Ireland. So things would be bought from all over the EU, repackaged, and then sent off to Ireland. Now, this now creates problems under the rules of origin of the trade agreement. Very few people in the world care very much about rules of origin, and very few people want to ever talk about them but you need to in this trade concept. And you can't do that on a high political level. You need to have experts talk that through. And hence, it makes sense to have all of these specialized technical committees. Now, the regular trade dispute settlement procedure will seem enormously familiar to anyone reading FTAs. It is a normal mechanism for dispute settlement under a free trade agreement, inspired by the WTO model, though without an appeal, which again is entirely normal for free trade agreements. It is contained in part six, article 734 and following. <clears throat> the purpose of it is it's a mechanism for avoiding and settling disputes between the parties concerning the implementation and application of this agreement and supplementing agreements with a view to reaching when possible a mutually agreed solution. Here already we see what was discussed in previous panels, that the EU insisted on this also being an umbrella for future agreements, which will already be imported. Those are the supplementing agreements referred to. So the dispute settlement agreement will also apply to them if ever they exist. Now, it's an, a dispute settlement agreement between the parties, between the UK, and the EU. On the practical level, that means it's not a mechanism between member states and the UK. That has actually become relevant when France had a fisheries dispute, <laughs> because as it turned out, France couldn't start dispute settlement. And so what happened in reality was that France uh, decided to uh, resort to retorsion legal acts that are very annoying to the UK, but that France considered legal and not a breach of international law. What does the mechanism look like? And I'm going to run you through it quite quickly. Uh, I don't want to bore you too much with the details. A quick word on all of the days that I put into this slide. Um, all free trade agreements these days set comparatively tight deadlines. Uh, the TCA has a regular deadline for all of the steps in the procedure, and then even an urgent procedure if, for example, you have to deal with perishable goods, 
The reason why there are such tight deadlines in trade is that the remedies you get at the end are, if you want to speak under general international law, countermeasures. You can only, if the other party doesn't want to comply, you can only then, to some extent, hurt the other party. That doesn't compensate for any harm done. So there's a need to get things done quickly. And that's why we have all of those tight deadlines. And unlike the withdrawal agreement, as Ursula has just told us, the TCA does not have a lump sum payment as a remedy. So a normal arbitration mechanism that starts with consultations. A party notifies we have a problem here, we need to consult, time frame for consultation. Then an arbitration panel is impaneled if there's no solution found, of course. Of course, the consultation, con the consultation period can be extended if the parties so choose. The arbitration panel consists of three arbitrators. If there's no agreement on them, it will be one named by the UK, one named by the EU, and one chairperson, uh, if there's no agreement on the chairperson, picked by the co-chair of the partnership council from the complaining party. There are lists for these arbitrators. So here too, a list approach is chosen and the lists are established as we will see in the next slide. Now, those three arbitrators deliver an interim report. Again, this is very much like the WTO where panels also deliver an interim report. There's an opportunity for the parties to request a review of a precise aspect. If they don't, the interim report becomes the final report. If they do, well, they rewrite it and there's a final ruling. Good, now we have a ruling that tells us whether there was a breach or whether there wasn't a breach. If there was a breach, the other party has to notify compliance measures. If they don't take compliance measures, if they can't comply immediately, they have to comply within a reasonable time. And there's even the possibility to arbitrate what reasonable means in that context. Now, that again is very much like the WTO. And they're, if you want more on the silly side of arbitration, because it's really quite difficult to say what reasonable means, read one of those um, uh, reports and you'll see what I mean in that regard. Okay, so reasonable time to comply. If they take a measure and there's disagreement on compliance, there can again be recourse to arbitration that goes to the original arbitration tribunal. Now we know whether there's compliance. We get to the temporary remedies. They're called temporary remedies because they're never supposed to be permanent. But of course, if uh, the non-compliance continues, the remedies will continue. The beginning of the, temp of the remedy stage is that the respondent party now presents an offer for compensation. So where they say, this is what we can offer you. We will, for example, lower tariffs for you in another field. <coughs> That doesn't usually lead to an end of the dispute. Usually the complaining party ends up suspending obligations. For the suspension, some areas are excluded. Uh, the level of suspension is equivalent to the, to the harm done to the violation, which is referred to as the nullification or impairment, again, WTO language. And you can retaliate and should retaliate, first of all, in the same sector. So if the harm is done in your goods trade, retaliate in the goods trade. But you can also cross retaliate under certain conditions. That's in Article 749. So meaning the harm is done in the goods sector, but you don't have sufficient amount of retaliation power in that sector. So you retaliate on services or road transport or something like that. The conditions are in Article 749. If there's a disagreement on the level of cross retaliation, again, that goes to the original tribunal to be resolved. If during that period, uh, the party in violation takes a measure to comply with its obligations, that also, um, and the other party says, well, actually, you, you're still not in compliance, that also goes to the original arbitration tribunal. So that is the regular procedure, as in other FTAs, you have arbitration, you then have a compliance stage, and ultimately, the procedure can end in 
the suspension of obligations, uh, which of course for traders is largely unsatisfactory, but that's the nature of trade law usually, meaning you feel your trade in cars is harmed by the other side, but what you get is not uh, the removal of the measure, but you ultimately get if the other party doesn't want to comply, is you can now hurt the other party on oranges trade. Um, that is how trade unfortunately works. Now, some specifics that are remarkable. The first one is the scope. Article 735 tells you to what parts of the agreement the regular horizontal dispute settlement procedure applies. Some parts are exempted. So for example, uh, the agreement makes clear that trade remedy rules under WTO law apply and there's no dispute settlement for that. That's fine, you have WTO law. There's no application to cultural property, which is interesting, to the annex on medicinal products, to small and medium enterprises, there's a special section on that. And so that section cannot be subject to dispute settlement, good regulatory practices, and disputes concerning the interpretation and application of social security coordination in individual cases. So you can't bring an individual case to dispute settlement. You have to bring systemic cases, I would assume. Now, important, there are some modifications for level playing field, but we'll discuss that in a moment. For law enforcement and judicial cooperation, the general mechanism isn't applicable. There's a separate one. And also uh, thematic cooperation. The Partnership Council, so the political body, can be seized even for excluded matters. Finally, uh, suspension of obligations under the TCA applies also to rulings of an arbitration panel under a previous agreement. So the withdrawal agreement can end up with uh, suspension of obligations under the TCA. That link is explicitly established in the agreement in Article 749, para 4. The dispute settlement me mechanism is exclusive for obligations under the TCA and under supplementing agreements, a common clause in many trade agreements. But of course, you have the problem, what do you do if you have a similar obligation in the TCA and in other agreements, in particular the WTO? Well, if there's arguably a breach of the TCA and of a very similar, substantially equivalent obligation elsewhere, usually that will be the WTO, the claimant can select the form. That selection becomes exclusive with a request for the establishment of a panel. So once a panel is requested under the TCA, you can no longer go to the WTO or the other way around under Article 737. But of course, there's a problem in the WTO, the appellate body no longer exists. So you might end up with an appeal into the void. The parties thought of that. If the other forum, the forum you chose, fails to make a finding for procedural or jurisdictional reasons, well, you can then go back to the other forum. And uh, if you went to the WTO and there's an appeal to the void, you can then go and to dispute settlement under the TCA. Um, there's a list of arbitrators for the TCA, three sublists, EU, UK, chairpersons, at least five people for each list. The chairperson list uh, cannot include nationals of either party. Finally, there are two annexes that are very relevant for dispute settlement, one on rules of procedure for dispute settlement. Um, nice side note, the language of the proceedings is English. Um, and Annex 49 as the code of conduct. So much for the main dispute settlement procedure. Now to some of the particularities um, and other procedures. For law enforcement and judicial cooperation, Title 13 of Part 3 establishes a separate procedure, an exclusive procedure. No other procedure applies, not the general one, <clears throat> not another one, just Title 13. That procedure basically envisages consultations, which last three months, where they have not led to a mutually agreed solution, and where the complaining party considers the, the respondent party is in serious breach, they can suspend the title to which the serious breach pertains with three months notice. So no arbitration, but directly a suspension of the title where the breach occurred. <clears throat> 
the respondent party can now, in response, suspend all the remaining titles of Part 3 by written notification. Again, three months' notice. And the suspension ends after the complaining party notifies its intention to reinstate the title and shall, it shall do so when it considers that the serious breach has ceased. So a simplified procedure ending the application of parts of the whole judicial cooperation and law enforcement cooperation mechanism. <clears throat> Finally, two of the major innovations which could very well um, influence trade law in other areas and with other parties as well. The first one, the need for fairness in trade. Now, trade has moved from basically being about tariffs to regulation as a trade barrier. And addressing regulation is incredibly difficult. The EU does so through the Court of Justice, the Four Freedoms, and harmonization, but that doesn't work in the international context. So how do you maintain the ability to regulate, and yet at the same time, make sure that your industry is not as a disadvantage because they have to fulfill higher environmental requirements, higher labor standards. Increasingly a problem, and here uh, they squared the circle, how to maintain the, regular, uh, the regulatory alignment that already existed as a condition for granting zero qu uh, quota and zero ter uh, tariff barriers without at the same time constraining regulatory freedom. So allowing the UK and the EU to regulate as they want, but at the same time, well, then eventually maybe suffer consequences. That was the problem that they had to tackle. The scope of the level playing field is competition, subsidies, uh, state-owned enterprises, taxation, labor and social standards, environment and climate, sustainable development. For each of these fields, there are material standards, and they're all different. Some are very expansive, particularly for subsidies, others vastly less so. These material standards have a mix of disciplines. For example, international obligations they have to sign up to, non-regression clauses, uh, some oblig and an obligation to enforce domestically. But the interesting part for us is what now happens to dispute settlement? Dispute settlement, the regular mechanism partly applies, is partly excluded. And in particular for labor, social, environmental, climate, trade, sustainable development is modified. Namely, you have consultation involving also civil society. Then you don't go to an arbitration panel. You go to a panel of experts for those particular fields. Specialists are established in that regard. <clears throat> The panels explicitly should seek information from, for example, the International Labour Organization, where labor is at issue. Interim report, final report. The committee, the government's committee in charge of this, follows uh, uh, and monitors the follow-up. And ultimately, for labor and environment, there's a reference to the temporary, temporary remedies as well. So unusual for the EU, remedies do apply also for labor and environmental standards. The most innovative mechanism, rebalancing, that's Article 411. That only applies to labor and social rights, environment and climate, and subsidy control. <clears throat> if a party thinks this is significant divergence resulting in material impacts on trade or investment, so for example, um, Absurd example, one of the parties decides slave labor is totally fine. As a consequence, the other party may now take appropriate rebalancing measures. The scope and duration has to be limited to what is strictly necessary and proportionate, with priority given to the least disruptive measure. There are procedural requirements, including consultation and the possibility of very fast arbitration with a 30-day time cap. But you can't invoke WTO law or other agreements against the rebalancing measures then taken. That allows each party to regulate as they wish. But if one party engages in excessive deregulation, the other party might say, 
Well, now you have an enormous advantage for your domestic industry. We think uh, that this divergence from our rules has a material impact on trade and investment, and we will take rebalancing measures. So we will, for example, reestablish tariffs. That is the rebalancing mechanism. Nobody can quite say how often it will be used. It's quite innovative, but it resolves an issue uh, that is now rather common, namely leaving open that regulatory space that countries insist on, yet at the same time, allowing for freer trade with the possibility to, if you want, ratchet back the protectionism you had before, if uh, the party deregulates. Or if you, on the other hand, um, protect the environment more and more and more, and this divergence then uh, creates a competitive advantage. <clears throat> Second innovation, need for speed. As there's no lump sum penalties or compensation under free trade agreements and under the TCA, you have a problem, a systemic problem in trade. If a party violates the agreement, well, you have to go through dispute settlement because only then can you impose countermeasures. They, can, they only become legal under the trade agreement once the violation was established and uh, you can take the temporary remedies in the language of the TCA. <clears throat> that means a party can regulate, violate the agreement, and then take the measure back after half a year, saying, you know, uh, no, no foul, no harm. But the harm actually happened. So there's a need to speed up procedures. One of the uh, ways in which this is done is through the deadlines, which are quite annoying. There's even a deadline of 46 days in the agreement at one point where you think, why 46, not 45? The other mechanism chosen um, was uh, remedial mechanisms. In the area of subsidies, for example, Article 374 allows such remedial measures. Namely, if you think there's a subsidy that causes or that seriously risks to cause a significant negative effect on trade or investment between the parties, you can make a written request for information, get a response, consult, and then the requesting party can notify after 45 days already and unilaterally take after 60 days appropriate remedial measures. So within 60 days, you're taking your countermeasures. They're restricted to what is strictly necessary and proportionate. There's a priority for the least disruptive measure, but you can take those measures without having to wait for a dispute settlement panel to adjudicate. Now, within five days from those measures taking effect and without prior consultation, the notified party can now request the establishment of an arbitration tribunal. Because now on the other hand, of course, the other party similarly has a need to accelerate the proceedings because the remedial measures are already in place. And the final ruling is handed down within 30 days. Uh, that is going to be a stressful activity for the arbitrators. Similar provision in fisheries, Article 506. And we, 506, and we already heard that fisheries is a dirty area. And this is confirmed here. Basically, what this mechanism allows you to do is a quick suspension of obligations for an allegation of violation. And then you are under an obligation to request a panel. So basically, you get the remedy before the panel procedure. There's also remedial measures in road transport, but I'll spare you those. And at this point, if you're still with me, uh, having suffered through all of the details of dispute settlement, Thank you very much, uh, and I'm happy to discuss. Thank you very much, uh, Holger, for this uh, very informative journey through the complex provisions on dispute settlement under the uh, TCA. Uh, we are unfortunately running somewhat uh, behind schedule, but I think we can take about 12 minutes for uh, questions. Um, so can I invite questions to both uh, speakers? Uh, Professor Lenarte. Thank you very much. Uh, one, I have two. One is very quick question. Just wanted to double check uh, with Professor Hestemeyer 
in the areas where um, the content, the, 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 the obligations overlap between the TCA and WTO, which are many, um, you mentioned that, of course, uh, the TCA provides that you could uh, choose the forum, either WTO or TCA, but I just wanted to, to, uh, to, to clarify if I understood it well, that if, um, if you choose the WTO and you don't, you, you don't complete the appeal, you can then go back to the TCA, because I understood that once you start in one forum, you're no longer able to go back to the other. But so this is just one thing to double check. And this other question that I had perhaps for both speakers is um, again, something that I, I already mentioned in, in my, uh, in the discussion that I had in my panel. Again, I, I'm very bothered by this fact that in terms of enforcement of TCA, TCA is an EU only agreement. So I was wondering if you, find that problematic, especially from the UK's perspective, that unlike the other FTAs and unlike the WTO, here you cannot reach the member states. So I understand from EU's pers for the internal EU perspective, that's not a problem, but from international perspective, that to me sounds highly problematic. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Let's gather um, a few more uh, questions. I, I saw one question here, Professor Clark. Yes, thank you, um, Emilia. I was wondering before if, whether this is not uh, now has changed with the Lisbon Treaty that the, the cases that have been brought against individual member states would not now not be possible anymore after the uh, competence changed uh, with the Lisbon Treaty for encompassing all of GATT, all of the WTO, all of it. That's just the, my, was my view on that. And I was, uh, Professor uh, Hestermeyer, I was wanted to hear, have your view on do you, is there anything comparable? In this sort of like mixture between arbitration, uh, cross retaliation, sort of managed cross retaliation system, and in, in 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 this um, in this treatment, uh, not that I'm aware of. And last point, uh, there was this uh, you mentioned Acmea and autonomy, of course, comes up. You know the the uh, autonomy uh, case law and uh, how 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 do you think the how do you see the, the this uh, arrangement with uh, this, with the TCA that. It's not supposed to be EU law, so there's no need to involve the, the, the Court of Justice. How do you see that? In, 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 yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, Thomas Jäger. Thank you. Also, I just have a very brief uh, um, question. I thought we discussed in the morning that the TCA is an association agreement. You insisted it was a free trade agreement. Maybe that's just a matter of perspective, but to you, but also to the previous speakers, maybe also to Ursula, um, could you could you each clarify why you think it's either one or the other? And the interesting question is, does it make a difference at all? I would think yes, in terms of procedure, probably also in terms of direct applicability. Um, so it's it's it, it's probably not uh, in, in different. And also, your first slide showed the whole Irish island uh, as part of the UK. So maybe you know <laughs> something about the application of the protocol that we don't. Um, thank you. Okay, let's go uh, to uh, responses. Perhaps uh, Professor Kriebaum first. Well, EU only agreement. You cannot reach the member. Uh, you. Yes, but let's, uh, I think there's already quite a lot of questions. Let's have responses and we'll see whether we have time um, remaining. Um, that you cannot reach the member states uh, and um, that might be a problem from a, a UK perspective. Um, yes, uh, it, it might be a problem, but they, they just... Uh, agreed on that that manner yeah so uh of of course uh it, it could become necessary just to take countermeasures and then you can get into the whole question of okay are you allowed to take uh, countermeasures even if that is uh not provided for or can you do that because you are outside the dispute settlement system as it is provided for and i think that's where you basically uh, end because it's then not within the self-contained regimes where you are required to uh, rely on, on the dispute settlement uh, that is provided for. That would at least be um, my guess, but apparently that was never an issue that it would be something different than an EU-only uh, uh, agreement in, in, in the first place, which uh, then makes it clear that you can uh, only have the 
uh, EU as a respondent. But on the other hand, I mean, if you look at the proposal that was never accepted uh, of the uh, EU accession to the European Convention on Human Rights, and the enormously complex co-defendant rules uh, that we had there. I mean, that was also not an easy option. Yeah? Maybe, but I was not involved at all in the in the negotiations. Yeah, maybe that was one of the the things that the EU uh, didn't want to have all these kind of co-defendant uh, uh, situations. And for the Commission, it's fairly easier the way uh, it is. Okay. Should I start? Yeah, yes, please. Thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll take it from, from the last question. Association agreement versus free trade agreement. I think there's a terminological issue here. Um, from the EU law perspective, it is an association agreement. Now, under international law and under trade law, association agreement is not a term that actually exists. Uh, it is, uh, to a large extent, irrelevant that it's an association agreement under EU law. But under EU law, it is an association agreement. And funny irony, um, the UK-Chile trade agreement is also an association agreement because they just copied it word for word, so it's even referred to as association agreement, although in the UK context that makes no specific sense. So I, uh, just to point out, for a trade lawyer who presents on WTO law, all of these EU agreements would be, depending on what term you prefer, preferential trade agreements, regional trade agreements, or free trade agreements, even though, uh, particularly for competence purposes, uh, under EU law, it's vital to distinguish. So for me, this is an association agreement under EU law. I apologize for the image. Those are the pitfalls of looking for images under common, uh, under common licenses. Um, shouldn't have done that. Um, <clears throat> next question, uh, the, uh, the EU only. I think the, the interesting issue here will be the attribution rules will be significantly different because anything that a member state does now will be attributed to the EU, even if it's with, without regard to competences, if it falls under the agreement. So that is quite an interesting innovation. I'm not entirely sure they've thought it through. I think the problem is more from the member state side, because while the UK has an easy route, simply start proceedings against the EU, member states have no recourse there. And, and for me, that is actually uh, a larger problem. Um, next question, overlap, that was just the clarification. Uh, yeah, indeed, there's language in the agreement um, for this, if you want, fork in the road clause that says if for procedural or, um, anyway, if, there's, if, if the proceedings can't be finalized, so it's not if you lose, but if the proceedings can't, uh, in the PowerPoint, I had the precise wording, and then you can, it opens up again. So this wording is to some extent directly targeted at the specific situation in the WTO that you can appeal in the void, into the void, and then you don't have a ruling, um, even though you might have won at the panel stage. And so in that case, uh, you can go back again. But there is a provision that otherwise says once you have asked for a panel to be established, your choice of recourse is final, with that exception that opens it up again. Um, next question, um, is there anything comparable on cross-retaliation? Cross-retaliation actually already exists under WTO law, allowing you to retaliate in other areas, of course, never as broad as here. As to the implications of Armea, I, I um, I was always of the opinion that if you copy EU law word for word and say, this doesn't apply as EU law, this applies as part of the trade agreement and can be interpreted differently, uh, then the tenets of Ahmia shouldn't apply uh, and feel free to criticize me in that regard. Um, I think that should have covered all of the questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. So final question of the day. Um, yes. I'd yes. like to ask uh, why uh, don't uh, use uh, uh, the Russian and Ukraine arbitration panel by the economy uh, and uh, territories, for example, question of territories and uh, just is uh, there 
the violence and the war. I'm not sure whether I, it was the question that why Russia and Ukraine are not using arbitration panels to solve their problem? Well, I mean, there was an attempt in 1899 in the first Hague Peace Conference by Tsar Nicholas II of Russia to have uh, arbitration as a mandatory instrument of conflict solving. Um, but Austria, Hungary and Prussia at the time were against that. So the result is that the permanent court of arbitration has been established, uh, but it is not a mandatory means of dispute settlement. So, which means that Russia and Ukraine would have to agree on arbitration. If they do that, then uh, this would probably be a useful means of dispute settlement, but unless they do it, um, they are not obliged to do it and, and it won't happen. Yeah. So if if at the end of the day they are convinced to settle it that manner, that could be a way out, but they would have to agree on that. Um, thank you very much. So uh, Professor Kribaum started us off by saying that it's highly unusual that we have such detailed dispute settlement uh, provisions, and that I think applies in fact uh, to both agreements, given that dispute settlement is often an afterthought. Perhaps the experience of the EU 28, as they were uh, at the time, over more than four decades uh, of the UK's membership in the European Union, uh, taught everyone that there are some disputes that cannot be settled through negotiations, that, that we really need uh, mechanisms for dispute settlement. We've heard that there, is some in, there are some interesting commonalities under these about both agreements when it comes to dispute settlement. And there is borrowing from other systems of a dispute settlement, but also interesting uh, differences. And perhaps these differences have a lot to do with one agree agreement being mostly about the past, moving on uh, from that uh, difficult divorce, and the other being mostly uh, about uh, the future, the sunlit uplands, as it is sometimes called. This concludes the first day uh, of our uh, conference. Thank you uh, to all our uh, speakers, particularly Professor Kriebaum and Professor Hestermeyer, since this is my panel and we haven't thanked them uh, yet. And thank you to all of you uh, for joining us uh, for uh, day one. Uh, we resume at 9.30 tomorrow morning and we hope to see uh, many of you back um, here then. Thank you very much and have a very good evening. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Ursula. Danke. Tschüss, bis bald. Tschüss. Ciao.